First of all, let me thank the organizer. It's great to be here. And uh, this is joint work with uh, Solmas and Satoshi, who are both uh, uh, in Australia. So let me give you some motivation for this work. So there is um, uh, a lot of papers in the structural transformation literature uh, stressing the fact that uh, home production is, uh, is key to understand structural transformation trends. Okay, here you have several papers by Rachel, Chris, and Joe. Um, all these works are done through calibration. So depending on the exercise that you are performing, you infer um, the role of home production and home productivity for, for these trends. Okay. Now, another strand of the literature, <coughs> what it does is to directly estimate a uh, structural transformation model to try to understand the forces that, that are behind the, uh, this process. Okay? And there are two papers in particular, um, Boren Kabowski and Arendt, Rogerson, and Valentini. So uh, what this paper do is to estimate the, what you would call the standard model of structural transformation with both um, differential TFP growth and non-homothetic preferences to assess which, uh, which is the role of these channels for, for structural transformation. Uh, however, this estimation, they don't have any uh, home sector, okay? So what we, what we want to do in this paper is uh, to try to fill this gap and estimate a structural transformation model with home production. Now, let, you, let me give you some more motivation for, for our work. Uh, what I report here is three time series. So in the left panel, what you have is the share of uh, market services in uh, what we call extended total consumption. This is just uh, uh, market consumption plus uh, home production, where home production data are taken from Bridgman 2013. Okay? So uh, he, he takes the value added approach and constructs some, uh, some measures for home production. That's, what we report here is the share of market services and the share of home production in this total extended consumption. And on the right panel, you have what uh, also Bridgman computes as a home labor productivity over time. This, um, this uh, vertical line uh, is uh, the year 1978, for which we find uh, a structural break in, uh, in this time series using by Emperon uh, structural brick test. So, yeah. Yep. Exactly. So, yeah, I, I will be more specific later in the presentation, but uh, what you do is to take uh, hours worked at home from service and uh, you attach some uh, wage from the market and then also capital measure and the rental rates. Okay. So, what I want to call your attention uh, on is that around 78, there are some things going on. Market services, they kind of accelerate the share of market services. Home production is roughly flat before and then starts declining. And I mean, this is clear. Home labor productivity stops growing. Okay. So <clears throat> what we do here <coughs> is the following. We take the most parsimonious model of structural transformation with home production that you can think of, okay? Uh, there are two channels of structural transformation, the usual ones, uh, differential productivity growth and non-homostatic preferences. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we take this model and uh, by using this data for home production together with standard uh, uh, market measures of structural transformation, we estimate the model for the US. Um, how we, how, which model we use? Well, we, we compare several uh, preference specifications, okay? Because when you introduce home production, it's not straightforward, which is the preference specification you want, uh, you want to assume. So we, we, we try several. And then we use the estimated model to run some counterfactuals to, to assess uh, the role of home production for uh, structural transformation. So this is the plan of the, of the paper and of the talk. Let me go to the model. As I said, the model is uh, standard, super standard. So uh, there are um, multi-sector model, time is discrete, a representative household, and 
uh, five types of goods. Uh, four are for consumption and one for investment. Okay. Uh, there is a competitive firm in each sector. Also at home, uh, we assume that uh, there is a firm uh, which acts as, as if in a competitive market. Okay. So household preferences are like this. So this is the intertemporal part. Then you have the usual consumption aggregator in uh, agriculture, manufacturing, and services. Uh, and services for us is an aggregator of uh, services in the market and services at home. Okay? And then you have a bunch of uh, non homotetic parameters around agriculture, manufacturing services, and uh, home services. Okay? This is the most general specification. Then I will estimate the model uh, using some restrictions on, on parameters. Okay? Uh, production side is uh, super standard. So Cobb Douglas in each sector and differential TFP growth allowed in, uh, in each sector. Okay, so the fact that I assume that uh, the home sector is also uh, competitive uh, allows me to, um, to derive uh, um, an implicit price for the, for the home good. Uh, by doing this, uh, I can rewrite the model as if the household were buying uh, uh, four goods in the market. And these, uh, uh, these rents from capital and labor are total rents. That is, the total uh, this guy earns in the market plus what he is earning uh, at home. Okay? Because some capital is supplied to the home sector and some labor is supplied to the home sector. Okay? So it's like implicitly he's earning the market rental rate of capital and the uh, market wage rate of capital. Okay. Now, as uh, is uh, common in these sort of models, uh, it is possible to separate the intertemporal problem from the intratemporal one. Okay, so you can write the intertemporal problem as this one, which uh, resembles uh, a one sector growth model with some uh, time varying weights, which are given by this part. Um, and price indices are defined in this way for uh, total consumption and for services. Okay. And then the, you have the intratemporal part, in which the household is choosing uh, the consumption level of the four goods, uh, subject to a constraint in which uh, uh, total expenditure is given by the intertemporal problem. So it's, this part is, ta is taken as given in the uh, in this problem too, okay? And for us, this, this part will be taken from the, from the data and this total extended consumption, okay? So it's consumption in the market plus uh, home production. Yeah? Sorry? Which one? You're talking about discount factor, the beta. I mean, this is, a, this is, the, this is the same derivation that Akos, uh, Bertolt, they have in the, in the handbook. Yeah, so we just have this uh, additional part because we, for us, uh, services is an aggregator, but it's fairly standard, yeah. Okay, so, <clears throat> The advantage of, of splitting the, the problem into two is that we can focus on the intratemporal problem. So we are going to estimate only this. Okay. Um, the advantages are that uh, we can be agnostic about the investment sector. So here I write the investment sector is hard to model. Of course, if you want to take into account composition. So if you are in a multi-sector model, and you consider that uh, not all investment is produced in manufacturing, as, um, as uh, some people are stressing, then you have to uh, have a theory of why the composition of investment is changing over time. Okay? We don't have a good theory for that yet, so uh, in this way we don't have to deal with this problem. Uh, and then we are interested in, uh, in uh, the parameters that are shaping structural transformation, and these are really preference parameters in general. Okay. <clears throat> so
So the data are this one. Uh, I mean, value-added consumption and, and price indices are from, uh, from this paper. Uh, of course, we use uh, their methodology to compute the value-added consumption, so remove the investment component. Um, Total value added is from the BEA, and then value added and labor productivity are from, from Bridgman. Okay. Um, sorry. To go back to, to your question, um, how Bridgman constructs value added at home, uh, this is just equal to uh, home uh, hours from uh, time use service multiplied by uh, some wage, which is hourly compensation of workers in the household sector, and then he considers two types of, of capital and some rental rate for, for the two types of capital. So uh, adding everything, you get a nominal measure of, uh, of, of value added. Now, um, once we write down the model, what we do uh, to estimate it is to construct the price index for home, which is consistent in, uh, with the model and with the data that we are using. Okay. So, by using first order, our first order conditions, you can write that the price of the home good is this function, okay? And you can rewrite this as uh, extended GDP, which is nothing else than uh, GDP plus home production, divided by home labor productivity, okay? Um, so, home labor productivity, of course, is uh, uh, value added, real value added at home, divided by uh, labor. Uh, and for the last equality here, we use this uh, um, total condition that the wage, which is here multiplied by total labor, which is one at the aggregate level, is one minus alpha uh, total GDP. Okay. <coughs> so, <coughs> given the the parameters that we want to estimate, which are preference parameters, and uh, the the data that we are using, we can solve for the three shares and use the iterated feasible generalized nonlinear least square, which is the same methodology um, Arendorf and others are, are using. Okay? <clears throat> now, which model we estimate? So which preference specifications? We, I will show you three cases, three different cases motivated by, uh, by theory and data. So, Usually in the literature, you have the standard aggregator with normal motaticity, and the interpretation is that um, CA bar smaller than zero is the subsistence level for food, and CS bar is uh, home production, okay? Now, first observation here, we have an explicit home production sector. Okay, kill is uh, object, okay? So first specification is uh, uh, exactly this. So just check the, the equation, you have non-homotheticity only here, only the agricultural one, no other non-homothetic terms, okay? This is, for instance, what Rogerson uses in his 2008 paper. Um, second case, um, we say no, uh, maybe uh, services, they have some characteristic that make them have a income elasticity larger than one, and that parameter is not home production, it's just some intrinsic uh, characteristic of services. So let's put back the CS bar uh, in the model. And so here you have CA bar and CS bar in our, in our estimation. Okay? In services, there is nothing. Third specification, we say, okay, um, maybe market services and home services, they have different, uh, a different degree of non homotheticity Okay? So let's remove uh, total CS bar from, from aggregator of services and put uh, a CSH bar in the aggregator of services. Note that by putting this term here, I'm making both this and this uh, non homotetic okay? Because uh, when you have a two-sector aggregator, you just put non homotheticity to one of the goods and both goods, of course, become, uh, get the non homotheticity <clears throat> So the interpretation that we give to this parameter um, if this is smaller than zero, is that uh, um, the household needs some amount of home services, minimum level, to enjoy all the other home produced services. So the idea is, is that if your house is completely dirty, you don't, you don't enjoy anything uh, that you do in your house. You cannot cook, 
you cannot watch TV because it's, it's a complete mess. So first of all, you have to clean your house, then you can enjoy the rest of uh, home production. <clears throat> Okay, so I, I will give you the graphical fit of the model first, then I will show you the, the um, regressions output. So this is the first model. In this model, there is a, a non-homotheticity only on agriculture and nowhere else. Okay? Uh, blue is the data, red is, uh, red is model. Okay? So visually fit is not great. Well, it's, it's okay for manufacturing and agriculture, not great for uh, home and the market services. Okay. Now, second specification, I will add back the CS bar. So the common term that we have in all uh, circular transformation model with uh, market services, this is the change in the fit. Okay, not much. And then, this is the model with the differential non homotheticity between home and market. Okay. Visually, the fit is much better, and of course, this is confirmed by uh, estimation results that I will show you in a second. So here, each column is a, is a different model. Just focus on the first three. So first one is the model with normal theticity only on agriculture. So only C A bar is estimated. The second one is the standard model of circle transformation. So you have C bar A and C S bar. Okay. And the third one is the one with the differential non homotheticity so CSH bar is different from zero, CSH, CS is, uh, is zero. Okay. So this is a fit of the model, Akaiki and the Bayesian information criteria. And uh, clearly model 3A is the best one in terms of fit. But it's also interesting that if you compare model 1 and model 2, uh, model 1 is better than model 2. So when you have on production, uh, the data are suggesting to uh, not to have this um, uh, CS bar. Okay? You have an explicit uh, home sector. Don't put uh, the CS bar uh, into your estimation. Three? Uh, dollars in, remember the base year. Maybe 2010, not sure, yeah. So um, the data supports, seems to support uh, uh, different income elasticity between home and market services. Uh, this is um, kind of new because uh, other, other theories were uh, trying to explain movement in the market and home with the differences uh, in technology. Okay, well, here we are uh, kind of discovering a channel for, for preferences. Okay, uh, this might, might uh, suggest to be um, cases with, when you are doing cross-country analysis because, I mean, uh, home sectors could be, uh, could be different uh, at different stages of, of development. Though, I mean, these guys don't seem to find too much of a difference in the size of the home sector uh, over the development path. Now, here I will show you some robustness, um, just to give you a sense of how, mo how the model is, uh, is working and what are the relevant parameters here. So here, this, this gamma is the, is the parameter uh, shaping the elasticity of substitution between home services and market services. Okay? So this is, this is larger than one because we, th I mean, we find and we think that these two categories are sort of substitutable. Um, and here, what we do is to fit into the estimated model. Well, uh, we impose that the, the gamma is the smallest value that uh, has been found in previous literature for es similar estimations between uh, home and market, and the largest value. So this is the smallest value found in the literature. If we impose this, you see the fit of the model is not great. If we put the largest value, which is 2.3, the fit becomes again uh, quite good. Also because we estimate this to be around 2.5, okay? So, I mean, this parameter is, is, is key, is, is crucial to, to account for the, for the change in the data. So, oh, sorry, not uh, 2.5, 2.75 we obtain compared to the largest uh, in the literature of 2.3, okay? Um, there is also a, a detail 
uh, that um, given that we have the non-homotetic parameters, that gamma is not uh, exactly the elasticity of substitution, okay, because you have to, in, to take into account non-homotetic, but we are computed uh, things properly and uh, the numbers are, are really very close. Okay, to, to this gamma. So I chose to, to show you the, the estimated value because otherwise you have a changing elasticity uh, as you move over time. Okay. Um, right. Now, um, these previous studies uh, in which uh, the, the standard model is estimated, they find that the, the sigma, which is the elasticity across broad categories of good, is, is very small, very close to zero. Okay, we, we find something similar. Our estimated the sigma is, is very close to zero, so we, we impose this, this restriction, and this is, this is the fit of the model, and uh, indeed, if you compare this column with the last one, which is the one in which the sigma is imposed equal to zero, uh, this is the best fit. This is slightly better than, than this one, okay? So uh, even adding the home production sector, uh, we find that uh, this uh, elasticity is really similar to, to previous studies. Okay, very, very small. Okay, in the time that I have left, let me give you some counterfactuals. So here we have a sort of uh, business cycle experiment, if you want. It's not really that, but something uh, uh, with that flavor. So what we do here is to um, impose that uh, total extended consumption is fixed. Okay, so the total amount that uh, the household spends in the, in the four goods is fixed, but uh, we give a shock or we change one of the prices to see what's the reaction of the, um, of the reduced floor problem. Okay, so how shares change. And uh, we compare to Herend of Rogers and Valentini, which is the model without home production. So this is a shock to the uh, manufacturing price. As you can see, the response of shares is pretty similar in the two models. Of course, they don't have a home share, we only have. And for them, uh, uh, total consumption is, uh, uh, is fixed while, uh, sorry, total market consumption is fixed. For us, it can change because we have the home dimension, okay? So here, nothing very, very different from their model. But if, of course, if you shock the price of services, the, the result is pretty different because um, our model is the blue one. You see that market shares, now they don't react much and the big response is, uh, is in the home, uh, home sector, okay? So the story is the, the price of uh, market services become uh, high, so you reduce consumption of market services and you produce more at home, okay? And so you kind of, um, make your business cycle less extreme, okay? Um, this, I mean, to me, this could be potentially important for welfare effects of downturns, okay? When you want to measure what's uh, the welfare effect of, of a recession, if you don't consider the home sector, maybe you are uh, thinking that the recession is bringing large welfare effects, but in the end, maybe it is not. Now, let me give you um, an idea of how much income and substitution effects matter here. So in this experiment, we leave income fixed at the initial level and we let only relative price evolve. So this is, this is what the, the model uh, returns. So as you can see, relative prices uh, drive structural transformation in uh, market services and in home, but not all of it. And uh, this is with price fixed at 47 values and income growing. So this is the non homothetic effect at work. Uh, the blue lines are always the data, red lines is model. Sorry, yeah, sorry for that. So uh, as you can see, non is uh, driving uh, structural change for market services and basically all of the decline of the home sector, okay? so. To relate uh, with the previous, oh sorry, I don't have the slide, but to relate with previous literature, um, uh, both non homothetic and um, substitution effect are important for structural transformation in the market because uh, I think Timo finds off and off the importance of, the, of these two. Uh, here we find that for home, the non component is the 
important one to drive the decline of home. Okay. Um, th I think this is the last thing. Uh, this is a counterfactual for home labor productivity. So as we saw in the data, at some point there is this big slowdown. So the experiment that we that we make is what if home labor productivity keeps growing like at a steady growth rate? Okay, what happens to, to structural change in the market? So this is what happens. Uh, services they they grow, but not that much. I mean, here it seems that they are flat, but I mean they grow. Uh, and home sector is uh, roughly flat, I would say. So to give you some numbers, just look at these these columns. This is the uh, accounting by considering only market sectors. So um, the benchmark is that in 2010 you have a share of services in the market of 0.84 in the US. Uh, if there is no slowdown in home labor productivity, uh, the number is 0 0.78 in, uh, in 2010, okay, which is uh, uh, a 7% uh, smaller share of services in the market. Okay. Sorry? Well, I think that all these experiments that I showed you is that, I mean, all things have a part of the play a, play a role in the story. So it's both technology, is uh, also nonomotricity, um, it's, it's different things. Okay, so I, I wouldn't say it's only it's only technology driving the the, the whole story. Okay, because I mean. <laughs> Okay, so let me conclude. Uh, what we do here is to estimate the structural transformation model with the home production sector by exploiting this, this new data. And the main findings are the following. So the popular specification um, cannot fit the data too well. Okay, so we propose uh, uh, an additional um, channel which is the differential non between home and market. Um, the data support that this uh, income elasticity between the two types of services is, is, is different from, from, from zero. And um, the slowdown in home labor productivity accelerated the, the rise of market services, but I wouldn't say it's the only determinant of, the, of that rise. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think I'm done. Thank you very much uh, for letting me read and discuss this paper. Uh, I like it a lot. Um, and personally, I always uh, is very um, interested in, and I think home production is important. So going back to Lawrence, it's basically things like, you know, cleaning, cooking, childcare. So for the US, it's about two, th so for average individual, two thirds of the hours you spend in the market, you spend at home. So market hour will be on average weekly 30 something and home hour will be 20 something. For many other European countries, even higher or you know, developing countries. So that's the home production. It's an important um, fraction of the economic activity. In the old days, they have been proposing including into the national account. And recently, Bridgman, he was uh, working at BLS. He had worked on that with his co-author co on this extended national account. So this has been uh, something getting revived. Okay, so it's something important. So the way I see this, pa um, um, this paper, I, I will put it, I will focus, because when I prepare the slide, I thought I have 10, mi 10 minutes, so I got too much, I'm going to skip some. So the way I see the paper, the main potential contribution to the literature is um, with, with get, uh, regard to this paper, uh, by Harando Rogerson Valentini in the AEL 2013. So it's a very similar spirit. Basically, we want to learn about the preferences because in this structural transformation literature, we talk a lot about forces driven by sector specific production function or because of preferences, there's income elasticity. Um, uh, goods like agricultural goods are inferior goods, services are luxurious goods. Okay, so, so um, in this paper, I call it HRV. They basically trying to estimate these preferences, but uh, what they did is they um, uh, ignore home production. So the way you think of what Alessio do and what HRV do is that if you set side equal to 
to um, uh, equal to one, then this is gone. So then you will get back HRV. So the result should be the same as HRV. So what uh, HRV find is agriculture, as many people would have expected, because service is rising so much faster than the relative price of services. So therefore, something has to do to income effect. So they basically find that agriculture is inferior and service is luxury. So in this paper, what Alicia will find is that actually if you explicitly put the home production in, then this side is significantly smaller than one. So that means home production is important. So that's the first finding. Second, which is something quite uh, interesting and new to me, which is that, well, maybe if we are going to allow income in that Elasticity, we might as well allow it for everything and allow it to be different. And that's show up in this C bar SH. So if C bar SH equal to zero, then home service and market service have a similar property respond to income. But allowing this C bar SH to be different than zero, you're allowing for different income elasticity. And what they find is indeed, the income elasticity is significantly different across home service and market service. And what is more interesting is that they also find that this C bar SH is negative. So meaning that there's some sort of necessity home service we need to perform, just like the way agriculture is. There's some sort of necessity. So if you take the result, the interpretation is what other people find when they do not take into account of home production, they think, oh, service is luxury. They always give example like health, you know, concert, this kind of thing. But what Alicia will find is, well, it's because you ignore part of it is a good substitute to something that is necessity. And that's what making that look like is a luxury. Okay, so that is a um, very interesting finding. So my main comment I'm going to uh, focus on is um, I wanted to, I, I have to be honest, I like the result, but I'm not 100% convinced at this point. And I'm going to point out one main thing why I'm not convinced. So let's recall what HRV did. So what you're trying to do is they, HRV only have the preferences. So they have this nested CES and they only focus on preferences. There's no production function in HRV. And why can they do that? Well, because they constructed the consumption value added. Now, this concept might be new to many people. So consumption value added is very different than expenditure. So if I buy this sweater, traditionally, when you know, people do expenditure, you know, doing income uh, elasticity, they look at the expenditure on the sweater. So what HRV said is you shouldn't look at expenditure only. There's two ways you can think about consumption data. And an alter alternative view is that when to make a sweater, you need to have raw material. So this is cashmere sweater, so you need cashmere. And you need manufacturing, so you have agriculture manufacturing. And you need retailing, the services. So you have to cut back out the value add. Okay? And that's what the C in the utility function. So HRV just uses the consumption value added and price. That's all they need. With these two information, they estimated that preferences, and that's their result. But as you have seen in Alessio's presentation, he actually need production function. So why did he specify his production function? Because he said, oh, we have data on home value added, but um, I'm going to construct some price based on some equilibrium condition. Okay, so how did he construct the price? Well, he said, let's say production function are identical, then when you have perfect mobility of, across different, different activity, then you can back out. So basically, this is equating value of marginal product of labor across sector. Uh, I missed the capital share here, K over, our, K over L to the power alpha. But that, because alpha is the same, so they all disappear. So basically, all you need is the real labor productivity in the home sector to compute the implicit price. Okay? So very careful, this is a real labor productivity. Okay? So then he said, well, I'm going to use the data from Bridgman. And so then, meaning that I'm going to take this A star SH from Bridgman and also the home value added from Bridgman because that's needed to compute the extended uh, GDP. So that's how it's constructed. Now, I wanted to reveal how Bridgman obtained this real labor productivity. 
Okay, or in general, what Bridgman does in, does in one uh, slide. So Bridgman started, basically have three steps. Step one, he com compute nominal value added, which Alessio showed the formula. So it's just a value added approach. Now for that, you need input, labor input, which is time you survey, number of hours you put in. And what he viewed is that the home sector is very close to what one sector called private household in the data. So he used the wages from there. Uh, then there's capital use. So he think of two kinds of capital, uh, a consumer durable and residential capital. Now there's uh, some small questions so th th in this construction, because this wage is the private household sector wage. I'm not sure whether it should be the same across the whole uh, economy. That's one thing, and we've seen before in previous paper you know, that could be quite different. And, and then uh, the measure of the capital and can also be problematic because, as I show with uh, Timo here, you know, a lot of this capital is both for home production and leisure production. So you can think of you need a flat, and not just to doing home production. Most of the time, when people don't do home production, they rest there. So that you have to think about what's the implication. But most importantly is this step two. In order to compute the real value added, in order to get the labor productivity, he need to get a price index. And what did he take? He take the price index of private household sector. So what they follow then is that, well, it's standard. what you did is very roundabout. You take the real and you compute your implicit. But actually, in order to obtain his real, he assumed a price index. So what I'm thinking is that you should really compare what you com constructed to what he used, because that will tell you a lot about what is being assumed in his paper and what is being assumed in your paper and how comparable are they. And if they are not, then there's some issue we need to think about before we draw the conclusion, especially your two main conclusion is, one is that um, home services is a necessity. So the interpretation of that is that the relative um, rise in the home service is not enough to explain the fall in the home uh, uh, service. So that's sort of similar to the intu intuition why we need CA bar less than zero. So that's one thing. And the other one is your conclusion that the slowdown of home labor productivity growth is important for explaining the rise in market services. And that's also very important because you know, if there's some, you know, is it, is it because the way you construct your P, or is it, you know, if you just take his P, what will that be? So I stop here. Um, I have other comments, but I can just give it the slide. 11 minutes. No, I don't think so. All right, thank you very much. say something else in terms of maybe like where the questions are. I don't think this detracts from the contribution. But if you look at the data, the question I guess I have is whether your non-homothaticity in uh, market, I mean in home production is basically the, the secular increase in female labor supply that we've seen. Because what, so what Bridgman I think does is he says, look, we haven't seen real wages uh, grow since 1980, and yet we st still see people going into the market. And so then it has to be that even though real wages aren't growing very fast, home product productivity is also not growing very fast. Um, but then you still have to explain why more people are going into the market, so you sort of need this, this non-homothaticity. But you could think about this as just female labor supply is going into the market that's driving down home production and that's also driving down the real wage. And so the question is, maybe this is like a reduced for, I mean, I think it's still interesting because it's kind of, it's a great way, like a lens for capturing these patterns. But I, I, I thought Rachel would have talked about her paper with Barbara. We have a paper on it too, but, but theirs is better. And I think they're, they're closely related. Gives you a transformation, but 
So I'm, I'm puzzled by the fact that technology gives you the transformation. But when you um, hold income constant, relative prices don't give you the transformation. Changes in relative prices. So that, that yeah, I mean, the, you, you, you did three counterfactuals. One, you, you held income constant and technology as in the market. Therefore, the result was driven by changes in relative prices. <clears throat> and then another one, you, you, um, you, you continued letting productivity rise according to trend. And, and that also explained it. That explained it along as well as income, which means that productivity is doing a different job from relative prices, which is surprising. If relative prices are reflecting productivity, then you should be getting the same result. Yeah, but that's not in the. Yeah, but that should show up in the counterfactual with income constant and relative prices changing. When you say because the relative cost of home production changes, and well, therefore you should have the same result as the relative change in, in productivity. I think it does. I mean, when relative prices are driving too. half of the of the increase uh, in uh, in market services. No, you should too. I, I, and We'll talk about it later. I think you okay. showed two completely different results with, with productivity and that. But why don't you respond to the yeah. points that... Uh, so, um, about your first comment, Rachel, uh, Bridgman Price. Yes, um, we thought that, uh, I mean, it was good to have the, the full model of uh, home production to, to really understand uh, uh, where this price was coming from. So once you do that, I mean, this is what we have to do to reconstruct the price within the context of the model. Okay. Uh, of course, we can also estimate the model uh, directly with bridge run price. Actually, we are doing it uh, for a revision, and um, results are roughly maintained. The only thing that changes is um, uh, we get a um, higher elasticity between uh, market and home services, so the gamma goes up a little bit, but uh, results are maintained. So. We, we, we debated a lot about whether we should go one way or the other. Um, I don't think there is one of the two which is preferred because um, it's true that Bridgman constructs the TFP or productivity uses, using this deflator. But if you think about it, in any structural change model, what you do is to compute TFP at the sectoral level. How do you compute that? Using um, sector-specific price indices, right? And then you plug these TFP trends in a model which will imply that, uh, I mean, if um, production functions are, are, are standard, the price that you will have in the model will be different from the one that you use to deflate your sector of value added to compute TFP. This, is, this will always be the case. So, in a sense, we are here we are doing the same thing. We are taking a TFP series and reconstruct the price in the context of our model, which is something that implicitly everybody does in a structural transformation model. But I agree that uh, it's not, we don't have a, a good reason to say this is the correct way to go, but we'll, we see it as indifferent as using directly Bridgman price for estimation. Yeah, and uh, um, to answer to Joe, we started this project uh, with genders. So we wanted to use this uh, um, slowdown in home labor productivity to explain female labor for participation. So this is kind of a side project that, that we have, but um, it, this is uh, fully related to that process. Um, I mean, I 100% agree with you. So this is, uh, this is my answer. 